introduce myself first, Miriam and Marcia Degi. It's a true pleasure to be with you. Um, I participated in We the People the very first year it was offered on the bicentennial of the US Constitution. I currently serve on the board of Center for Civic Education and have spent a good part of my career providing opportunities for civic education to people living in, in not free countries like Iran, where I'm originally from. My name is Sue Leeson, Senior Justice, Oregon Supreme Court. Tim Moore from the Center for Study of the American Constitution at the University of Wisconsin. It's great to be here. You, you guys are? My name is Pratik Shah. I'm on student council and I'm part of my school speech and debate team. I'm Tyler Hughes, uh, an Eagle Scout and an avid reader. I'm Hannah Larson and I'll be going to ASU in the fall majoring in interior design. And our coaches are Ms. Lindblom and Ms. Litzenberger. Fantastic. Thank you. I will go ahead and read the question. It's, this is unit one again, his philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system. Um, the question begins with a quote from Benjamin Rush. The American war is over, but this is far from being the case with the American revolution. To what extent, if any, did revolutionary principles influence constitution making during the founding period? What problems, if any, does the principle of consent present when creating or amending constitutions? To what extent, if any, are revolutionary principles evident in modern times? Please begin. Benjamin Rush was correct. The revolution was not over. So when the founders met in Philadelphia in 1787, they employed revolutionary principles upon which they built the revolutionary document, the US Constitution. Now, the founders did not create these revolutionary principles. They had predated America and its founding. The novel concept in American design was that the founders wove these principles together in order to create an entirely new form of government. An initial revolutionary principle enlisted was limited government. Importantly, Roman philosopher Cicero recognized that governments were innately corrupt. So a solution, an equal balancing and blending of monarchy, democracy, and aristocracy. As well, Montesquieu argued for a separation of powers further limiting government. Since the founders experienced a tyrannical king in parliament and a failed Articles of Confederation, they established a limited government utilizing these philosophical theories. Articles one, two, and three divide the power between legislative, executive, and judicial, and give each the ability to check one another. Then, to ensure the preservation of natural rights, another revolutionary principle was imbued when the Anti-Federalists insisted on the addition of a Bill of Rights. The colonists rebelled due to their lack of consent in Parliament. Thus, the founders granted the power to choose their representatives in Article 1, Section 2, and the revolutionary principle of popular sovereignty was knit into the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence announces governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That is, that government is made legitimate only through consent. The U.S. achieved consent in the creation of the Constitution and its amendments through the principles of republicanism. Article 7 required specially elected conventions for ratification and Article 1, Section 2, and the 17th Amendment meet the requirement of consent for the election of the members of Congress who represent the people in the amendment process outlined in our Amendment 5. In a more revolutionary light, modern constitutions try to achieve legitimacy through direct popular participation in the constitutional process, but not without challenges. According to the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, although popular participation leads to an increase in transparency and accountability, there is no proven link to subsequent legitimacy of government. And the risk of depletion of resources due to high cost manipulation of popular opinion by power brokers and the possible violation of minority rights pose troubling challenges. Additionally, countries lacking civic education face increased challenges. Revolutionary principles are evident globally now more than ever, yet they are also threatened. In Russia, China, and Turkey, the principle of limited government has been tested. These countries have constitutions that separate power between the legislative and executive branches, but it's clear that the strong executives, Putin, Xi Jinping and Erdogan maintain absolute control. Without an independent judiciary, there is no sufficient check on their power. Natural rights have also been challenged internationally for farmers in India, protesters in Hong Kong, and the Rohingyans in Myanmar. Also, suffrage is the expression of the revolutionary principle of popular sovereignty, an expression that is continuously threatened by those in power. Recently, the coup in Myanmar, the cash for vote scandal in Egypt, and the elimination of poll watchers for their presidential election in Uganda represent this threat. 
In the US, strict voter ID laws, reductions in early voting, particular to mail-in ballots, and restrictions to voter registration all establish barriers to voting. Georgia's Election Integrity Act of 2021 is merely one recent example of this. Revolutionary principles, while present, are threatened by government abuse of power and rights. Benjamin Rush understood that the revolutionary principles of the war would remain a driving force to the creation of our new government. What he may not have envisioned is the continued need to uphold these principles by subsequent generations. So we echo the words of Rush for our generation and say, the revolution is not over. Uh, think I'd like to start out, uh, a push back a little bit. Uh, you know, the anti-federalists saw the Constitution in total opposite terms of what you've described. Why is it that they, I mean, if we could dig them up and bring them here, why is it that they were not convinced that your explanation of the Constitution um, was consistent with the American Revolution? They said it wasn't. So we see that one of the anti-federalist biggest fears was simply just an overpowering central government. They were more in favor of state governments and power in the states. And we see that they're especially afraid of the people's right being infringed. In Brutus too, they say that those in power have been proven in all ages to expand their power and abridge public liberty. So thus they were not um, a big fan of this idea of a big national government. Also, George Mason, he cited that the Constitution was a document that didn't outline all the human rights that people needed. So they, he said that they needed to have a Declaration of the People's Rights, which would become the Bill of Rights within our own Constitution. But he said that he would not be able to sign it. And he also took back to Virginia when they made their own state constitution, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Well, in this sense, are the anti-federalists the true American inheritors of the American Revolution? I would argue no. Although the anti-federalists, as previously mentioned, argued for a Bill of Rights, and many of the ideas were actually insisted upon the creation of the Constitution, they aren't the true inheritors. If anything, we needed a combination of the federal government and to make uh, the maintenance of the Bill of Rights and American rights in order to create the perfect Constitution that would able to expand and for new problems and new expansions to rights. I'm really surprised that... Go ahead if you want to have another point. Sorry, I just was going to say that I think that both sides had very legitimate fears and very legitimate like views of how they wanted the country to be, but it was through collaboration and um, making these compromises that we find the true revolutionary spirit. Okay. I was really surprised in your presentation not to hear any references to the state constitutions that were adopted starting in 1776. The United States Constitution wasn't our first revolutionary document, was it? What principles do you find in state constitutions that help to inform what went on in Philadelphia? In the Virginia Constitution in section one, uh, they stated that all men are created equal and that they should all be treated equally. Now this didn't apply to the slaves within the Virginia state, but it applied to all white landowners within the Virginia state saying that they would be equal. Well, and you need to take it farther. Article one of the Virginia Constitution is the Bill of Rights. What does that tell us about a revolutionary principle underpinning a constitution? And why isn't it? Anyway, stay with what, what is going on in the states in terms of revolutionary principles in our constitution. A Bill of Rights, that's one, keep going. Um, the constitution also in, uh, I think Massachusetts also had like the governor and the vice governor, which would set up the idea of an executive branch where we have the president and then the vice president which would divide, well, not divide the power, but give uh, the president an able person to help him as he does his diplomatic duties, as well as his executive duties. In addition to the Massachusetts Constitution, we see a free African-American named Prince Hall in 1707 argued for the nature of inalienable rights. In addition for the natural rights, being a free African-American from enslavement, he argued very rigorously for the natural rights of African-Americans and equality. Not only did he see the idea for natural rights, but this also led to a limited government, because if we don't have a limited government, we also don't see natural rights being actually properly respected. So the argument for the judicial branch to have an active role in voting that legislation that is going and encroaching the rights of an individual should be put down by the judicial courts. So we see this idea of limited governments also in the Massachusetts Constitution, which we can see later in the ideas of the federal constitution. Okay, you mentioned um, several countries uh, that are not democratic, that are lacking uh, consent of the governed. Um, 
based on your reading, your study, what do you think is their best course to gain consent, to gain representative government? So the process is a bit tricky and depends on multiple countries. For example, in Bolivia and Afghanistan, in Bolivia, we see a constituent assembly where a lot number of individuals voice their concerns about constitutional amendment and creation. And in Afghanistan, we see a public referendum, similar to the idea of referendum that we have in the Arizona constitution, but their referendum is a more public effort. So it's not just individuals going out to get signatures, it's a public referendum. The problem with this is that certain countries can't just have massive democratic reforms for public participation. We see under uh, Executive Bihari in Nigeria, although he wants direct popular participation, things such as a lack of public infrastructure to have voting resources available to all individuals, which leads to certain provinces not being able to get their vote, and massive corruption that stops individuals from having, having a say in the government, leads to a lack of resources, leads to a manipulation of popular opinion by power brokers, that Nigeria fortunately gets um, troubled by. So we can see that maybe having constituent public assemblies is a good idea, but doesn't fit all countries. What about the idea of civil disobedience? How far, how, how, what do you see the role of that in these countries that are extremely repressive? Do you think it'll work? How does it work? So John Lewis cited the idea that we need to protect the spirit of America, but also I think civil disobedience should protect the spirit of ideas of revolution, like such as uh, natural rights and social compact theorem. Now in countries such as China, where they believe in the idea of communism, and um, they also use the philosopher Tao as a way to say that if you were part of the party, then you also need to, after you've taken power and then you've used your power indirectly, or the communist party decides that you've used it incorrectly, you need to go back amongst the people and learn the correct way so that they can re-educate you. And then you can go back to returning to power because now you have this new idea behind you so that you can learn. And going along with China, we also see that there are protesters for certain things, such as LGBTQ+. Um, there has been a rise in protesters of, that, of people being um, openly um, gay or homosexual and also just openly transgender. Um, and they're doing this on like social media platforms, um, YouTube, Instagram, and then also just representation through media too. There's a lot of people out there writing like web novels and stuff that focus on the LGBTQ plus community. And so we see that in this pushback, they've started to fight for more rights for themselves. Now on topic of Myanmar, although we see a very repressive government with the removal of Aung San Suu Kyi, the grandchild of a very benevolent leader within the Myanmar, we see that the military using their military uh, clause in the Congress saying that they any proposal has to have beneficial of Congress um, benefit of the military. We see that in order for Myanmar to progress in democratic institutions, we have to have credibility to the voter system. Now, I'm not saying Aung San Suu Kyi was the perfect leader, while she was a supporter of the Rohingya genocide. We argue that a credibility in the voting system of opposed to just a coup by the military is the best way to achieve a progress for democratic institutions is the best way for Myanmar to progress. Tim, do you have a question? I do, I do. How do you tell the difference between a reform movement and a revolution? I think a reform movement focuses on like one particular aspect. For example, like the Black Lives Matter is all about um, getting more equality um, for these minority groups, such as obviously um, the African Americans, while a revolution is more of a very general overturning of a government like we did against Great Britain. But, but we kind of borrowed some of their ideas. So, I mean, isn't the American Revolution kind of a reform movement? Uh, yeah. that, that's where I'm, I'm wrestling with. Is, was the American Revolution a reform movement or a revolution? I would argue that technically every revolution is a reform movement. So under preamble, it dictates that prudence indeed will dictate that long established governments should not change for light and transient causes. And sentence in the preamble that it's not just simply a reform, it's a revolution. The same way as the American Revolution declaring complete independence from Great Britain. That was a revolution. A reform is a broad movement that simply seeks to change the government. A broad reform for BLM is, for example, policing powers or just creating equality for individuals. That is an example of reform. So technically, yes, every revolution is a policy of reform. A revolution is just farther because the government, they don't see a possibility for reform within the government. They just see a change of government. What about so I want to take you... Go ahead, Sue. Well, I want, then I want to take you back to your opening statement where you talked about a blending of monarchical, aristocratic, and democratic principles as part of limited government. Is that how you view the United States as a blending of those three principles? 
Uh, yes, I believe that the executive branch is an extension of the monarchy in our system, and the aristocracy would be an extension of the Senate slash House of Representatives, but the um, democracy aspect of it would be the House of Representatives itself because of the bicameral legislator, but also due okay, to our state. I, I don't know a single founder who would agree with you or that you can get that out of the Declaration of Independence. You think we have monarchical and class aristocratical elements, that would mean that that Judge Moore is correct. We didn't have a revolution, we just had a reformation. We just rearranged the principles a little bit. We're doing it slightly differently, but the same things are still there. I think it's- Does everybody not agree? Oh. <laughs> Gee, we're just getting good here. <laughs> I guess I'll start with the feedback then, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, I, I, uh, I appreciated your, your framework to, uh, to define the American Revolution as uh, emphasizing separation of powers, an emphasis on, on uh, rights coming to the forefront. Um, I, uh, and I like how you tied, you tied those to uh, various branches. You, uh, you made an, an argument for the ratification process is consent-based. Um, the amendment process is consent-based. So uh, I, I, I like the fact that you were, you were linking those ideas to sp um, uh, specific provisions of the Constitution. Um, I think uh, when it comes to the history, uh, I think we could have, um, this, this is my little grumbly here, I think on the history could have been a bit stronger in um, to Sue's question on the state constitutions, as well as maybe a little bit more on how the anti-federalists saw themselves as the true inheritors of the revolution and said that the federalists were undermining the revolution. Uh, I, I, a bit more, I think in that area, um, uh, would have uh, would have helped, but uh, there's a lot of information here, and you use uh, there's a lot of supporting evidence that you use, and uh, I appreciated uh, and the, your your uh, breadth of reading showed up in the use of those evidence uh, pieces of evidence. So thank thanks for thanks for being with us today. Appreciate this. I'll piggyback on that. I think uh, you your lens was very wide and i'm not sure if the re the rest of the day we will hear another team that brought in as many um global examples alongside historical american facts and and arguments rooted in the founding um this is a matter of opinion for sure but i'm going to put it out there when you when you go down the road of bringing in a global perspective as you have then I think it's really incumbent upon you to point out the difference between democratic revolution and revolutions that at, at their core in, in terms of ideology and in result uh, end up making people much less free. I think you have to get that, <laughs> that core distinction if you're going to go down the road of um, of talking about uh, the world at large. And this is where American exceptionalism comes in, of course, because it's a revolution that resulted in a democracy. That is actually not that common. Uh, revolutions have a tendency to take people in a, in, in, in make lives much worse uh, if you look at it from a global perspective. And so when you're talking about China or you're talking about um, Myanmar, Burma, you need to point out that reform is just not going to work, you know, or, or what we understand the way that Tim, Tim framed the American Revolution is possibly a, a really a, an effort at reforming all institutions, values, processes that were already inherited from the British. Um, you're not going to be able to do that with a communist party in China, or you're not going to be able to do that in North Korea, or you're not going to be able to do that in Iran because to get to a democracy, it's a completely different set of principles and uh, processes. And the consent isn't gonna come from things as they are now. I really appreciated the lively conversation and your organizing framework. Here's what I find intriguing about it. Rush is speaking in January of 1787. The Constitutional Convention convenes in May, June, depending on how you view what happened that summer. The state constitutions had 
for the most part, already been drafted in an operation for a good number of years. And yet you're willing to agree with Rush, the revolution is not over. Therefore, something had to happen at the Constitutional Convention very different from what had gone on in the states, all of which had bills of rights, limited government, and were based on the Republican principle of consent. And so what I was missing in the presentation is what made whatever happened in Philadelphia and the creation of the United States Constitution unique and a completion of what had been started but not finished uh, in the states. And so that's, that's one place I would, I would push you. The other place is you did not list an independent judiciary as one of the important principles. And yet in your, your conversation with us, the existence of an independent judiciary seem to be a critical element of your understanding of the principles of, uh, of limited government. And then towards the end there, I, I, I think you do have to rethink whether the United States is based on the concept of popular sovereignty, or if in fact there are still elements of class sovereignty and, and what the effect of that is for our understanding of our political system. A very nice presentation. Thank you so much for your hard work and your ability and willingness to engage with us at such a high level. Thank 